And uh, that's the prevention arm of health services and it's public health that often ends up at the bottom of the queue with funding decisions. And we need to look at the whole system, the NHS, social care and public health all together and take a long-term view as, as well as address the here and now. Well, Sean Worth's point there, mm. though, really, that, uh, and, and I have to ask you because you're the, you're the MP, you're the politician on the panel, it's, mm. it's a nettle that politicians seem loath to grasp when it comes to, to root and branch Reorganisation, perhaps? Maybe that has been well, tried. We're getting on to that. Of course, what the health service doesn't need is a massive organisational churn. What it needs is some stability. Um, but, as I say, what we do need to get better at is planning for the long term, not just for the funding, but also for our workforce, and thinking about where we can invest the money most effectively to get the, the best for patients and come back to patients and what they need. OK, Helen Stokes Lampard, I mean, with that celebration of the yeah. longer life expectancy, nevertheless, then the creeks, the Brains are really beginning to show now. Well, they are, because for all the reasons articulated, and actually health and how health is determined is much wider than health care and social care and the public health. It's, it's education, it's the econ economics of a society, and it's all those things together. So we can focus tonight on the NHS, and that's right and proper on the eve of its 70th birthday. But actually, we do need to look at health in the wider sense when we look about people's well-being. And Sonia mentioned about uh, yeah. our unhealthy living, about, you know, so many of the diseases of our modern society are related to the lifestyles we lead. And so, you know, and society can, has a part to play here. This isn't just about the NHS getting its house in order. This is a wider thing, too. And we need to think about that as well. David Nicholson. I, right from the beginning, I would say that I think the private sector can help us in lots of ways in the, in the NHS, and does help us in lots of ways in the NHS. But, Is it over politicised, that but, argument? Um, well, the, the issue for me very often is that it's about the values who drive these organisations, about the, the right values. But can I just raise the issue about, I think Sean mentioned the taxpayers bailing out the NHS in some, in some way. The thing about we have to understand is that health expenditure is a really good thing. Economically, it's a really powerful thing. It's one of the best ways that you can improve economic growth in your, in your society. Public expenditure on healthcare, generally speaking, gets spent in this country with people who work in this country. So it's a really powerful way of driving the economy. So we shouldn't protect, you know, we shouldn't get ourselves into a place that somehow health, in, you know, health uh, expenditure is something we need to avoid or is, is difficult. We need to make sure that... But there we, has to be a limit to it. I mean, do, th th there is a limit to how much the nation can afford, of course, sure. Of course there is. And I have to say, I've worked in, you know, a large number of countries over the last four or five years, and there isn't a country in the world who sat there at the moment thinking... We've got it all sorted. We've got enough money in our healthcare system. We're doing everything that we need to do. So this kind of tension and pressure is, is a, a necessary part of uh, uh, delivering a healthcare, healthcare system. And the other thing I'd say is that there is a, there's a slight issue here about public sector bad, private sector good. And all I would say is that in terms of labour productivity, um, mm -hmm. labour productivity in the health service over the last seven or eight years has been remarkable. It's grown at a very high rate. In fact, if labour productivity in the rest of the economy had grown at the rate that it has in the health service, we'd have paid off the whole deficit of the yeah. country and we sat on a pile of money. So, you know, there well, are things that... NHS people, leads the way. In, industry should follow. Other, pe other people can learn. I just want to ask, Sonia, Sonia that point that uh, David was making, I mean, do, do you think that, you know, private sector bad, public sector good? No, I don't. I think that's way too simplistic. Um, I don't think that... I wouldn't like to see 50% of NHS services delivered by the private sector. I think that would change the feel of the NHS. But I think where there's a very strong case that the private sector can add things, great. The one word of caution would be is that the state has got a history of writing some pretty bad contracts with the private sector. Just look at PFI deals with hospitals, for example, that, that led to the building of new hospitals. So it's definitely not the case private sector good, public sector bad either. I think we have to take a very pragmatic view about things as they come up. And Sean, uh, this issue of um, the spending being a burden that uh, David's uh, pointing out, that's not a burden. There, there are huge benefits from it for, for society as a whole. It's, no, it's not. Of course it is. It's fantastic. But I, I think there is a, a reasonable argument to say that if you look at the trajectory of how much spending has to go up to meet the demand of the NHS, right, it is going to get bigger and bigger. We are going to be, you and I are going to be paying more in income tax to fund the kind of NHS that we want. And, and I think most of us probably accept that. But there's got to be a, there's, we've got to have more than that. We've got to have new ideas, new technology. We've got to embrace change. 
We've got to embrace innovation. And nothing should be taken away from the NHS. I'm arguing that more should be put into it. But it doesn't have to all be money. OK, well, we're just uh, laying out the groundwork uh, at the moment. We'll get much more into funding in a moment or two. But I want to ask you, Lord Darcy, and this is, this is the C word, and it is crisis. Now, as long as I've been in journalism, which is uh, more years than I want to remember, we've been talking about a crisis in the NHS. Is that one from your point of view? It's challenging. I wouldn't... It's crisis. It depends how dramatic you want to be. Yeah. Well, well is, it, is it us journalists that are describing it as a crisis? But, yeah, I mean, it seems the general public are beginning a to feel huge, like that too. It's a huge, huge pressure uh, within the system. I work in one of a hospital like this, across the river, at uh, St Mary's Hospital, and we can feel that on a daily basis. We have staff shortages. We have a huge growing demand in the A&E. We have issues in admitting patients for elective surgery. So there are challenges, but the system is coping. The one thing, may I just say, I've just done a recent review with IPPR, mm -hmm. and I looked at the quality and the outcomes of care. Now, than 10 years ago, when I was in office, and I led a major review, and I could confidently tell you that the quality and the outcome of care today is significantly better than when I was a minister. That's a fantastic news. So despite all the crises, whatever you hear in the papers, cancer outcomes are better. There's a 5% improvement in survival in one year. There's tremendous improvements in cardiovascular disease. I'm not saying it's we're done. There's a long way to go, but it is much better. What is challenging is what we call access, getting into the system, yeah. whether it's primary care or hospital. Once you get into the system, you'll be rest assured you're going to get a good quality care. Well, uh, a lot of thoughts on that I can hear from uh, the panel uh, beside me, but we'll get on to, to those in a moment or two because, Sir Lord Darcy, you touched on the issue there of outcomes, which leads us nicely into our next session when we will hear from our advocates. But I want to remind you all first off, though, that at the end of tonight's debate, our studio audience here at Guy's Hospital will be voting on what they've heard. They are listening intently and choosing whether more public money, this key question, whether more public money or more private investment is the best way to secure the future of the NHS as that argument develops throughout the course of the evening. But now I want to focus a bit more on that issue that Lord Darcy mentioned there that surely resonates most with everyone involved in the NHS, patients and staff alike. That is the care that it provides and the outcomes. First up this time is Sean Worth. Sean. Thank you very much. Um, so we talk about NHS being in, in crisis. Social care is a massive problem. And I promise you, having worked in politics, in opposition and in government, no politician will want to be straight with you about this problem or want to talk about it with you. Um, that, 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 that's the unfortunate truth. Um, again, we've got a huge problem. The, the social care system is not funded publicly. It is a mix of private investment and everything else. The only thing I would say to this is that it is literally inconceivable that we tack on an ageing population with huge social care needs to the taxpayer bill of younger generations. It's not going to work. No serious economist has even looked at this and said that that's going to work. You shouldn't have to pay for it. Um, the, the big thing that needs to happen is that the, the, the generation most in need of care is actually the wealthiest that has ever lived in this country. They're sitting on a trillion and a half uh, pounds of housing equity. It's a controversial proposition sometimes, but I believe that people should take the responsibility to release some of that wealth that they have to pay for their, for their social care needs in, in, in order to protect younger generations from having to pick up the bill so that they can have the opportunities that they have. But so that it's fair, just to finish, so that it's fair and, and some people don't face catastrophic costs and others, you know, um, by good fortune don't have any, there should be an insurance pooling system, um, which, the, which unfortunately the market cannot provide because it can't, it, it can't cater with the, the extreme risks at some end of the population. The government should step in and help to create that, but people unfortunately will have to uh, take more responsibility for, for social care in later life rather than putting that burden onto their children. OK, insurance funding for social care with a, an initial investment from the government. Sonia, what do you think? I completely disagree with Sean. Um, so I think uh, there's a really important principle enshrined in the NHS. And it's not just that uh, the affluent pay more than the poor through their taxes for care. It's also that the sick don't pay more um, than the well. And if you look at cancer care, if you get sick, your costs are covered. 
at the moment, if, you, if you're unlucky enough to get dementia, your costs aren't covered unless you don't have um, very many assets. And I think that's incredibly inequitable. Why should we apply that principle of if you're sick, you don't pay, pay more than the unhealthy, uh, than the well, rather, in the NHS, but not in social care? And I think that distinction creates all sorts of problems in the system. Um, we don't even save enough for our retirements for, for the healthy period of, of living when older, let alone the miserable prospect of spending a few years in a care home in the run-up to our death. People are always going to underspend on social care. That's always going to heap pressure on the NHS. So I think we need to fund social care on the same basis as the NHS. It's time for a 1948-style settlement not for the NHS, but we need to extend it to social care. Now, you might say, gosh, how do we pay for it? Well, we're a rich society. We can afford it. Of course, we should ask the baby boomer generation to contribute more, but that should come through progressive taxation so that those who are unlucky enough to get dementia don't end up paying more than those who are lucky enough to live well till the end of their lives. And the final note that I'll end on is I, complete, I completely agree with Lord Darcy that extending lifespans are an amazing scientific achievement that should be celebrated. But the fact is, at the moment, they do come with a price tag. Until we discover that elixir that allows us to li live in perfect health until we reach our deathbed, there are costs that come with it. We have to be prepared to meet them as a society. Otherwise, quite frankly, the consequences are un unpalatable for our mums, our dads, our elderly relatives. So this is a cost we can afford to bear. Economists have actually looked at it. Uh, a very prominent economist did a review for the King's Fund back in 2010 and concluded that it was was possible as long as we're, our politicians are brave and say we did this for the NHS in 1948 we're going to do it for older people here and now in 2018 and I think they can do it okay well I'm going to come to uh, Sarah Wollaston on that in a moment <laughs> or two but Helen you are nodding along there mm. and give me it from the perspective of GPs this dilemma they're really rather caught in the crossfire in all this aren't they more oh. and more in particular elderly people coming along Absolutely. seeing their GP and GPs not knowing what to do with them, where, well, where we know to what send to do, them? But the, 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 the hospitals are yeah. full and the social care so, system a mess. What, what, what a do really, they do? I use a really simple metaphor that people's lives are their physical situation, their social situation and their psychological situation. So when they walk through my door, I'm interested in their medical problems, but also where they live, how they live and the care they have matters too, and also the psychological elements. But you can look at the another three elements, which are the primary care sector, so general practice and the first point of contact care, the secondary care sector that Lord Darcy represents and the hospitals that David has, and also the social care element. And if one of those is out of balance, the pressure on the others is completely untenable. So we have to get our social care embraced into this. I absolutely agree with Sonia. I mean, it's a really bold proposition. I like it, I like it a lot, and I'd love to know how we could work it. But actually, we do have to have them in equipoise because it puts the rest of the system under strain. General practice, huge strain at the moment, unprecedented. Well, is it, well, is it a mess? I mean, have you seen areas, do you know of places where it actually works in the manner you describe, where it is joined up? Well, you can, yes, there are some really bold adventures happening out there. So you've got places like Manchester who are taking a bigger picture view of health and social care and well-being and getting education involved and local government involved. And I mean, it's a big experiment at the moment, but we're watching closely because it could have lessons for all of us. From my point of view, the bit I know best is general practice, and we're desperately short of GPs. We're probably about a GP short for every practice in the country. I mean, that's the harsh reality of it. So when the patients come through the door, not only are they struggling to, they're struggling to get the appointment, and when they come and see us, when we try and do our stuff and our best for them, We've got nowhere to send them. We've got, we're, we're compensating for the social care sector. We're compensating for the fact that they've had their operations turned down, that they can't get an appointment. It's a year to see a specialist. And we're, we're, we're firefighting. Okay. And that's not right. We, need, we can do better. Well, I'm keen to get to Sarah on, on, on those, some of those funding models in a moment or two. But David Nicholson, the thought occurs, and I want to hear from you on this, on, on the best practice. And I know the NHS for many, many years has been observing and encouraging best practice and carrying out it, experiments and tests. It doesn't seem to spread though it doesn't seem to get joined up if you find somewhere where it does work it doesn't move on this is not unusual in healthcare. Healthcare change in healthcare is really tough to do anywhere in the world but people will will tell you that partly it's because we've got a very educated and discerning workforce who don't want to just be told what to do. They want to discover themselves, work out how to, to do it, and make the connections themselves to make it happen. And sometimes that takes time. 
And in a strange kind of way, by trying to rush some of this stuff, we've actually slowed it down. Um, uh, there are all sorts of ways in which we can make it happen. In, in different countries have tried different, different methods, but at least we have a healthcare system which enables it to happen. Most other countries don't even have a system that can work like that. OK, we're going to get on to reorganisation yeah. uh, in a moment or two in our next section. You touched on that. It's all going to cross over, of course it is, and particularly at the centre of it, all this issue of funding. And there we had it encapsulated, Sarah Wollaston, there. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Sonia Sow is saying, for, for all the problems, we can afford it, we're a rich nation. Sean is saying, well, you know, let's bring in some money from those that, uh, that can pay. And this, of course, was elements of that were in the Conservative manifesto in the last election, and look how that went. We, we can pay, but we do need to level with people about how that's going to be funded. I'd be delighted if there's a Brexit dividend. I don't happen to think that's going to happen. We can't depend on it. Um, what we need to do is level with people about how we can bring it in. And, of course, there are things the government can do about adjusting, for example, whether they uh, cancel plan changes to things like corporation tax, and tax thresholds, we can grow the economy, but we also need to actually say to people, are you going to be prepared to pay more? And we need to do that fairly across the generations. We can do it. Uh, we know that they provide pre-personal care in Scotland, for example, and it produces savings to the whole system. Because if social care fails, people end up in much more expensive settings in hospital. So it's the right thing to do. And it also protects people from catastrophic care costs. Um, and my committee worked with the citizens' jury um, alongside another cross-party select committee. And the citizens' jury, uh, a, a number of people just like yourselves in the audience, felt that they wanted to see um, extra taxation earmarked for the purpose that it was intended for. And they suggested, and we agreed with them, that actually having an extra premium to national insurance, for example, but spread fairly across the generations. They also supported having an earmarked element to uh, inheritance tax. So we do actually bring in part of that asset yeah. Would well, you like to see fairly. that in the Conservative manifesto? Um, I mean, it's, I think, it's Lib Dem policy, well, isn't it? Penny for the NHS. Well, the sad trouble is we've had a political failure. One party brings up something and another party says it's a death tax, then the next time round we get told it's a dementia tax. We've got to get to grips with this. That's what I think. And I, I believe that the public want to see political parties working together well, that's a very good getting point. this sorted. Which, and we've suggested that well, uh, across parties. Well, well let's, let's bring it across the parties, because with your, yep. your Labour politician hat on, that, that does happen, doesn't it? I've witnessed it, where, you know, one party in power comes up with uh, some kind of solution for social care, the other lot call it a death tax, they get into power, yep. bring it in, and the opposition call it a death tax. Well, let me just start. I fully support Sarah, absolutely delighted what she said. L let me give you my own example. 25 years ago, when I started as a consultant, where I am now, I could see a patient who's an 85-year-old, and I use this recently as an example, who had a cancer. I wouldn't have operated on this patient 25 years ago. With the technological advance I can, I could do a keyhole operation, wonderful lady, delightful, wonderful recovery, ready to go home in 48 hours. She's still in hospital a week later because there is no social care. Do you know how much that costs the NHS? Three billion pounds a year. Three billion pounds of your money. That is equivalent 2.3 million bed days a year. No surprise we can't get patients in. So there is a negative impact here. And the manifesto of the Conservative Party, I, I, you know, I, that was a good idea. Terribly communicated. Awful. You know, it, but <laughs> actually, been fact, no go back and see the policy of it. There was something yeah. in there. And I think I put all my confidence in the select committee coming up with something embracing, you know, stop playing party well, politics with health and social care. Party agreement. And, uh, I've got agreement here. Mm. Uh, just before we move on, I've got to ask our two advocates, though, to have some interchange on this very issue. I mean, Sean, could you not live with... You both agree that more money has to go in. You know, if the public did support it, could you not live with it coming from general taxation? We are a rich nation, as Sonia says. If the public could support it is one thing, but, I mean, m my argument is about younger generations, actually, because the... You're, what you're, if you take Sonia's argument, you're, you're looking at a problem and you're just pointing at people and saying, you've got, to, you've got to put cough up more money. And these are people that don't get free university education, they, they can't get on the housing ladder, they don't have final salary pensions, they don't have the kind of wealth that, that an older generation that we've got has, has uh, amassed now. And I'm just saying, in a progressive society, 
Should we not burden okay. younger generations? Should we ask those that need that to just to do something more if they've got the wealth to do okay, it? OK, I mean... That's my I mean so Sonia, why can you live with that? But a progressive policy, and it is true that one generation yeah. seems to have a lot of the wealth particularly stuffed away in their the houses. Answer, yeah, the answer is very simple, to Sean's point. You do it through progressive taxation. So you do it through wealth taxation, like inheritance tax. You might look, for example, at taxing um, people in retirement who have big final salary pension schemes. They don't they paid off their mortgage, they don't need that money. So you do it through targeted taxes. Ah. But the big difference between me and Sean is I'm saying, whether you've got dementia or not, if you're older and you're affluent, you pay into the system. I think we mustn't forget as well, there's this whole stereotype and myth that all the baby boomers are hugely wealthy and sit on million pound houses. That's absolutely not the case. It might be true in okay. some bits of London. It certainly isn't true in other bits of the country, okay. like Wakefield or... Quick Apple, thought from David, you, you had your hand up, well, and then we must move on. Only that there's a real dangerous argument here about pitting generations against yeah. each other, when actually it's about them working together. So in Germany, they talk about the young for the old, the poor, the rich for the poor. You know, as social solidarity, that's what it's, that's what it's about, and that's most important. Very interesting point. Listen, we must uh, move on because there is so much to consider. And what we want to consider now is how the NHS is organised, uh, how the money is allocated, how it's spelled. Spent well, the Health and Social Care Act back in 2012 was intended to reduce bureaucracy, but actually made the system more complex, many think. So is the way money is managed fit for purpose? Sonia Soda starts this time. Please give us your views. Well, I don't know about you, but every time I hear the term reorganisation, it just makes me want to switch off. The NHS has been subject to a number of really big organisation reorganisations over the last 20 or 30 years. And I think, invariably, these are the pet projects of politicians who come in, want to leave their mark, saying, hey, we're going to mix things up here and do things differently. And often there's very, very little evidence that a big structural reorganisation is going to do the thing we all really care about, which is improve the quality of care. So we've had, you know, purchaser provider splits, uh, scrapping PCTs and replacing them with CCGs, acronyms that really just make your head hurt. And I think we need our politicians to be much longer term about the NHS. There's no evidence that doing a wholesale reorganisation improves care. There is one big structural issue that needs fixing, and that's the one that I've already talked about, which is the split between the NHS and social care. But that seems to be the one big structural problem that politicians just don't want to fix. So I think we need to focus much, much more on quality of care, our inspections regime. How do we make sure that staff that see something going wrong feel able to speak out without fear of losing their jobs? That's the sort of stuff that improves the quality of care, not Andrew Lansley sitting down uh, with a flip chart and uh, redrawing uh, the structure of the NHS. OK, Sean. Well, Nobody would have designed the NHS as we currently have it if you had a, a, a fresh start. We have a very separate system of social care, as, as Sonia said. Uh, we have hospitals, which is a completely different system from your GP, where you often go first um, with, your, with your first complaint. These services aren't really that well joined up, and there are efforts now to try and integrate them more. You'll hear the word integration a lot when you, when you hear about um, uh, healthcare. And, and I agree that structural reorganisation is, you know, I mean, it just switches people off and it costs a huge amount of money. So I'd just go back to my original argument. Um, the issue with the NHS is not that it needs to be shaken up and reorganised and everything else, or, or you know, the, the, the model changed, it, you know, everyone accepts and likes the way we get free care if we need it, and it's very equitable. The issue is, can the NHS keep up with the demands that we're continually placed on it, and can it embrace change, new technology? So I'm saying that it needs to bring in more expertise from outside itself, um, not selling bits off, not charging people, but allowing the services to be delivered by many, many more different types of providers, some in the private sector, some in social enterprise, charities. It's already happening in small patches, but we have a ridiculous, controversial privatisation debate, which is completely manufactured and false, which prevents this from happening. And finally, the, the worst part of this is if you actually do a poll with ordinary, regular patients and say, would it be reasonable, would it be beneficial to try at other providers to deliver your services and give you a choice of that? The vast majority of them say yes. And most interestingly, it's the poorest who most want that change because they face the least choice under the present system.
OK, thank you both very much indeed. Uh, David Nicholson, I mean, on the issue of reorganisations, you went through a fair few yourself. Do, do, do they end up just rearranging the deck chairs? <coughs> well, the first thing to say is the international evidence is very clear on this. It doesn't make any difference at all what kind of organisation you have for your healthcare system <laughs> in managerial terms. What matters is what, how many doctors, nurses, allied health professionals and how much money you spend on it. That's what makes the difference to, uh, to, to outcomes. And very often, uh, in my experience, it's been, um, I think it was described by uh, uh, Mary Goldring, as messing about, masquerading at action. So that when we lose the... When everything else is too difficult, we reorganise. And it's, it's really dangerous for the, for the, for the system. Um, uh, just to decide, I was looking at the Gosport report, which is, you yeah. know, everybody in healthcare should look at, look at that. And, uh, uh, you know, a whole lot of things have been said about it. But one of the things you look... When you look at it, the number of different people who were engaged and involved in the management of that hospital and the supervision of that hospital must have changed almost annually from 2000, you know, right the way through that yeah, period. But, but it's, back, and, it's back also to the point you were making about empowerment of the people who work there all the time in this issue of whistleblowers, of people speaking out about bad practices and yeah. people speaking about best practice as well. So, so where you start from is you, you get people to work together and they start to tell you what kind of barriers and obstacles there are to working in the best interests of patients. And then you build your organisation around that. You don't do the other way around, which is to stand with Andrew Lansley's flip chart. It was a very large flip chart, I have to say. <laughs> uh, and then draw it, draw, draw it all out. That simply won't get you to the right place. OK, well, uh, Sarah Wilson, I mean, you know, Andrew Lansley, Lord Lansley now, um, he's the man behind it all. What were you thinking at the time as you were hearing the well, plans coming down the, the track? The select committee very clearly said that we thought it was overly complex and, and the point is that we focus too much on systems and as David Nicholson says, you know, the big question should be does it make the experience better for patients or not? And the answer is... It very rarely but do you think does. that question wasn't front and centre? It was all it about It wasn't. A, I mean, you know, the, the, the trouble is that you know, many of us said at the time that this was overly complex, in, you know, introducing far too much fragmentation and it would have been better to have focused on patients. And that, unfortunately, did not happen. Because, you know, if you look over the years... I used to teach junior doctors and medical students and I gave up teaching them about the structure of the NHS simply because <laughs> I didn't knew... Understand it. No, because it would have changed by the time they qualified. And, <laughs> and that is the try. And the other thing that we found on the select committee is we have this acronym spaghetti, yeah. STPs, oh. CCGs, you know, all these different things, ACOs, nobody knows what they mean. And, and the, the question we do. have to ask is, does it make the experience better for patients? And very often that means focusing at local level, getting people to work better at local level, rather than just having this endless debate about changing around yeah. systems. Let's focus on the patients. OK, I'm going to come to you, for Helen, very, very shortly indeed. But Lord Darcy, you yeah. know, with, with, with senior technicians of Angle, like that, like you, practitioners within the NHS, yeah. do, you, do you get frustrated by what you see from the, the managerial class? Absolutely. You know, when I go to the ward, first thing I ask, who's in charge? When I treat a patient, the patient and the family says, who's in charge of my care? I say, I am. There's an accountability issue as yes. well. It's not a structure. And it's not just me, it's the nurses that help me, it's the physiotherapist who's looking after the patient, it's my communication with the general practitioner who's going to take over the patient when it comes to the community. Everyone knows who's in charge. If you look at the landscape nationally, there is NHSE, NHSI, CQC, PHE, HEE. It sounds like a big newly discovered drug. <laughs> you, you go out there and say, who's in charge? I mean, 10 years ago, at least, I used to turn around when I was in office, you know, who's in charge? Nicholson was in charge. Yeah. And decision needs to be made, he was the accountable officer. Now we have very... We, we need to re-bring this, align this, and I'm delighted to hear from the health select committees. In actual fact, to be fair, the Prime Minister said recently, if the NHS feels the management, the doctors, the nurses, the GPs working in it, that there would be a simplified way of managing the NHS, then it should go to the select committee. And I'm looking forward to some form of common sense in bringing not okay. just structure but accountability. Just, well, just before you come back, Sarah, I just want to hear from Helen because GP is obviously yeah. hugely important after those reforms put right into the, the middle of it all. Did, did they get too much of a burden, in a way, out of all this? 
you know, we can spend all our time looking backwards, Dermot, but where we are now, we need to be looking forwards with healthcare. As everyone has said, we wouldn't choose to be where we are. We are where we are. We need to learn from the past. But let's look forward about what we can do to improve the current situation. I mean, obviously, I'm going to argue for shoring up and supporting general practice. We are in a parlous state at the moment. We've had these promises, and, but we're still desperately short of people. And that's not just about GPs. It's about district nurses, health visitors, physios. It's the whole healthcare team in the community because we know that the most effective and efficient way of running a healthcare system is to invest in your primary care infrastructure. Because when we're functioning well, we protect people, we save them. They don't need to go to hospital as often if we can do more for them in the community. Everybody wins if the general practice is in a sensible state. Sarah, you wanted to make a quick last point? Yes, it's on one of the section. things that we recommended on the Health Committee was that if we're going to make it simpler and there need to be tweaks to the legislation, please let's have that designed by the health service and social care and patient groups and then we will examine their recommendations. But as David has said there, perhaps there's no point. Now, leave it as it is. Is that what you are saying? Leave it as it is. It's, it's been done. There's no point. It may, might not work, but leave it as it is and just let's concentrate on the funding and the resources. Well, there is no doubt. I don't know whether we're going to talk about the 3.4% at some stage, but the, <laughs> well, that's key, what we're getting on the to. Key, key bit of all of that is how do you turn that into people on the ground as quickly as you can and you've got a system which is not designed to do that so there is some urgent work needs to be done and i okay. i would say it should be driven by the front line but should concentrate on simplification that should be the and at the end of the day if we can't explain it to the patient and the public how it works how on earth All can right. we explain uh, it uh, and thank you for mentioning the 3.4 percent uh, the 20 billion we're getting closer and closer to the point of voting on that one last topic though before we get there before the audience uh, get to have their say when they vote on whether more taxation or more privatization is the best route forward for the nhs and i i want to look now at the pressures the future and perhaps the solutions that are coming down the track as we Look to the next 70 years of the NHS. Sean Worth, first this time. Yes, I think, I mean, looking at the debate tonight, I think you can be a pessimist or an optimist. The pessimists will look at the huge pressures on the system and think, oh, goodness, we just have to put our hands in our pockets and continually pay more and more and more until essentially we're taxed out of, out of pocket. There's a positive vision which says, we, yeah, yes, we'll have to put more money in, but we'll have to change as well. And the NHS has to be faster adapting to new technology, new providers, new ways of working, all the things that we want to see the NHS do, that patients we know want to see the NHS embrace, but doesn't happen at the moment because, uh, basically because of politicians and the NHS establishment being resistant to that change. Um, the key, I, I, what I'd really love to see, and, and, and there's a, this links to the extra funding going into the NHS, I would love to see that funding not being poured into doing the same old thing the same, you know, at the same time. There's money going in, and I know it has to fill some gaps, but let's keep some money aside and create new funds for really innovative new practices that we can, from around the world, including new medicines, which are terribly slow to get to the market, uh, um, from market, sorry, to the patient. Uh, again, because we've got this incredibly complicated uh, system. Um, let, let's get that money into more innovative services, bring new providers in, and new medicines, get that to the front line. That's what I'd really like to see the future of okay. the NHS. OK, Sean, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Sonia? Well, Sean talked about pessimists and optimists, and I, I think it's pretty clear who he was referring to as a pessimist. <laughs> I, would, I would characterise the debate slightly differently, though. I think it's a debate between realists and fantasists. And I think the real position is confronting the extra costs that face the NHS and, say, being optimistic about our capacity as a wealthy society to pay for it. I think there is a lot to be excited about in terms of the medical technologies that are coming down the line that's gonna make our, that are going to make our, our health better, things like genomics, artificial intelligence, big data. And I think Sean's been a bit unfair on the NHS, actually. The NHS has been at the pioneering edge of some of these technologies, like immunisation over the years. We just learned um, yesterday, in fact, that the NHS is going to be pioneering the use of genomic technology. So doctors are going to be able to look at cancer tumours and try and predict using the gene DNA in them, I think, I'm not an expert, uh, to see what treatment they might respond to best. So there's definitely stuff to be excited about. Two words of caution, though. First is that 
this medical technology is expensive generally. It's not really a way of saving money. It's stuff we need to spend on to improve care to make sure we do all get to our deathbed living um, really well. And the second is I think sometimes it's easy to get obsessed with technology while forgetting some of the simple and the basic stuff. And I talked about the fact that a big challenge to the NHS is that people have got many more conditions that are chronic, that are, that are associated with lifestyle, obesity, drinking too much, smoking, not doing enough exercise. Now, there are services that work in helping us live more healthily, things like stop smoking services. But a big challenge is, is that it's become much easier for the government to cut stop smoking services, say, than it is to touch the NHS, because we're very protective of our hospitals. And that means we've seen some of the services like stop smoking being cut, and that's going to load even more oh, costs on the NHS okay. in the future. Sonia, I'm going to cut you off there, because guess what? We're running out of time. But I'm going to start, <laughs> I'm going to throw this back at you. Start with Sean, first of all, because, uh, Sean, you were accused there of perhaps uh, being, being a pessimist. You're not excited enough about the future of the NHS. I'm very excited about the <laughs> NHS, and I, I'm certainly not criticising it. it. Is You're right, it's the, actually of the public sector. It's the biggest um, user of new technology there is in the public sector, and so it should be, because it's the biggest public service we've got. <laughs> but, you know, you c you know and, and I'm not saying... Not, there's no criticism, and it does a fantastic job. What I'm saying is that we need to add to it. We can't, we can't okay. just keep it the same and ask the tax. All right. Uh, do you pay the same old thing. Sean, thanks very much. Of course, I can throw that back at Sonia. That's all he's saying is, you know, bring in some expertise from outside if it's going to benefit the NHS. But the reason I implied that he was a fantasist is that it's, it's wrong to think that you can do that without more resource. Resources aren't the, aren't the only answer. There's no way that just by putting more money into the NHS it's going to be the best service in the world. There's other stuff we have to do. But it's an absolute fantasy to think we, we right. already spend a lot less on our international competitors or some of our international competitors on our health system. It's a fantasy to think that if we don't invest in it properly, it's going to continue to be a, a world class. Okay, service. right. Where did the time go? Our experts here chomping at the bit to uh, get their say. Lord, Lord Darcy, uh, yep. optimist, pessimist uh, about the future, 70 years more for the NHS and, and much more? Always optimist. I've just told you, doubling life expectancy, that's because of science, innovation and technology. Absolutely. That's the evidence. Looking into the next 30 years or 70 years, the examples have been talked about. Machine learning, for example. You know, we, back in, 19, in the 1940s, we saved Europe and the Western world on the back of Alan Turing's work in breaking a code. Why can't we break the genome code and understand cancer? and have targeted treatment. We can do that. We have the science in this country. We should be very proud of it. It's not an added cost. Every pound we spend on health, you get two pounds. Well, you pounds, can sell that around the world. Two pounds you? back, absolutely, you monetize, absolutely. You get, we, do you know how much the, the life sciences industry brings 67 billion pe uh, pounds back to this economy here? So we need to be celebrating that. You know, 70% of the British population have smartphones. Why aren't we using that in delivering healthcare and advice? Uh, and communication. You know, it's all okay. out there. We just need to embrace Sorry, Lord Darcy, we are running out of time. David Nicholson, I, I want to come back to that point you made about the 3.4%, the extra money going in. We're, we're talking about resources now and, and the future and the continuing demands. And you mentioned productivity, but isn't it the fact that uh, we're hearing now from health chiefs there isn't much more to go for in productivity improvements now? It is all about the money. But many of the things that Lord Darcy was describing improve productivity. And I, and I think if you, th if you look around, I mean, most healthcare systems in developed countries are going through this argument, this debate at, at the moment. There are two things they're all saying. The first thing is that in the future, people will have to take more control over their own health and their own health care than they do now. And, what you, and we need to help people to do that. And technology is a fantastically incredible thing to do that, to, uh, uh, you know, um, all sorts of things we can do that. And the second thing is investing in primary care. You know, those two things, right. everyone is thinking. And that is, I think, where, they, where the future is. And particularly lies. technology when it comes to GPs, Helen. And we're hearing Absolutely. that what, this year we're all going to be able to get an app and book uh, appointments and know, no early morning phone calls and pretending it's an emergency. There are loads we'll believe of, that when we see it. <laughs> there are loads of exciting apps out there. And, I mean, this, this new all-singing, all-dancing NHS app 
Great. Lovely, logical, sensible. As Lord Darcy said, 70% you know, of people have got smartphones. Lovely. But actually, what we mustn't do is widen the health inequalities in our society. I worry about the people who haven't got a smartphone, who can't access the internet, the people who more than ever need to be able to turn up at a surgery in their community with somebody who knows them and cares for them and understands their whole uh, issues. And because they can't do that, they're turning up at A&E departments. Well, exactly. And, this is, and that doesn't help anybody. It's, we need people to get to the right place and get the right care. Apps, lovely. And if you want to know some great apps, look at the NHS digital website. There's loads of really fun apps on there, good healthcare apps. Put Get you moving. Put there in a moment or two. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, Sarah, glass half full or empty? Oh, I'm an optimist. But what I'd say is that the NHS's greatest asset is its workforce. So let's not forget developing, training and retaining our, our workforce across the whole of health and social care. And if we're going to do something in digital technology, I'd like to see, rather than the Secretary of State owning your medical records, I'd like to see you own your medical records and for you to be able to share them wherever you go so you're not having to keep repeating your story and having notes and records lost. Oh, well, they tried you that, didn't them. they? That but they, huge they, 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 it, was, it was done very badly and we need to learn the lessons from how that failed uh, decades ago and get it right this time. But we got it wrong last time because we wanted it all controlled still by the state and we need to put the power back with you, the patient. You own your record and share it with who you like. Well, what a nice point to end our contributions from the panel. That is the final contribution uh, in the debate from them. But before the audience gets to vote, the all-important audience vote on who's made the most compelling case, we'll have a final word from each of our expert advocates, encouraging you to vote for them. And first with their closing statement is Sonia Soda. I've presented a simple case here tonight, I think. Living longer is something to be celebrated, but there are costs involved with it. And if we don't face up to it, we are going to end up running the NHS into the ground. The arbitrary rationing we've seen in the last year, the cancelled operations, that's going to get worse and you're going to see more people opting out and getting private health insurance. That's going to create a two-tier system with one standard available for the affluent and one standard available for everyone else, and particularly those on low incomes. And I think that's going to undermine the very basis of our taxpayer fund funded universal NHS that is really adored by the public. So I would urge you to vote uh, for putting more taxpayer money in. It's the only way forward. OK, are we going to hear something very different? Yes, we are, from Sean Worth. Sean. We are. I, I don't think money itself is just the answer. We're going to have to pay more in because we're a growing ageing population. Fine, we will put more money in. But we've got to add more. And I think that, at, you know, the final piece here is opening the NHS up to more private investment, social enterprise, charities, come in, help deliver these services, help us create new ideas. The smartphone apps we're talking about, why not put them on prescription if people haven't got smartphones? We can embrace, change, new ideas. We have to think a bit outside the box. Money is not the answer. OK, right, there they are, the closing statements from our advocates. Those are the arguments. Now it's the turn of our audience who've sat and listened very intently here this evening. They have their say on whether increases in NHS funding should be paid for out of higher taxation in all its forms. Now, each of you has a, a voting pad, I know, uh, sitting there in your hands. If you've been convinced by Sonia Soda's case for a fully taxpayer-funded NHS, it's very simple, press... Option one, option one for Sonia's view. If you don't agree, I think Sean Worth is right that the NHS needs more private investment of whatever kind to survive. Choose option two. Let me repeat, it's very simple. Option one, if you agree with Sonia's arguments that it should be paid for, more money for the NHS should come from general taxation. If you think that uh, the private sector, private funding has a role to play, vote number two. And we will process that very quickly and bring the results to you all in a moment or two. But if you haven't made your mind up at home yet, uh, there's a lot more information I can tell you about the National Health Service, including special reports, analysis and interactive graphics on skynews.com. You can also join the debate on social media. Just use the hashtag NHS70. And we'll have much more coverage here on Sky News tomorrow as the NHS formally marks its 70th birthday, including a special service of celebration at Westminster Abbey, which just shows the place it has in the nation's heart. But now I think I can bring you the results of the verdict on, of tonight's debate. Uh, we have 46% voting yes, that is yes, to more funding coming from...
taxation, only 54% saying no. Now, interestingly, I want to compare that with uh, the straw poll, a similar vote we put to our audience before we came uh, live on air, and that uh, compares... There has been a shift in opinion, a slight shift in opinion, because uh, when we voted uh, just before, as I say, we came on air, 39% uh, said yes to more funding coming from taxation only. That's gone up to 46%, so well done, Sonia, with your <laughs> persuasive arguments. And 61% before we, before we uh, came on air, 61% uh, thought we should look at other forms as well. That's uh, still a majority, though, so well done to you both, <laughs> Sean and Sonia. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Now, I want to get final thoughts on that result uh, and how the audience changed their views. And thank you very much indeed for listening so intently. From our panellists this evening, we'll uh, just go down the panel. Uh, Lord Darcy, are you surprised, first of all, by, by the numbers that support the different options? I, I, I mean, to be honest, they're there, more or less. Well, it's more or less 50-50 now. 50, 50, but, but, you know, absolutely. Would you have expected to be more weighted towards general taxation? I, I would have been, because there was a recent survey nationally which suggested that 80% of people would like to increase the funding of the NHS through taxation, and that came across, but, you know, you have different audiences and uh, different... Uh, Indeed. Uh, so, Indeed, you know, but what it, what, yeah. what it does tell us, though, is that, you know, there are other ways of, of raising money. And, of course, sure. we talk about the NHS being free. Of course it's not. We, we just all pay for it. We absolutely... There is nothing for free. You are paying for the NHS. But the only thing I will add to that, how much you pay for the NHS, how much we all pay in this country, compare it with other countries, we do very well. It's the most efficient system. If you look at the outcomes at a national level, we do much better for the amount of money we spend. OK, uh, Sarah Wilson, a majority here for um, looking at other ways of getting money into the National Health Service. And, of course, one looks uh, just across the channel and beyond and uh, we're thinking here um, of, you know, some, some degree of private insurance, perhaps. What I think is um, interesting, though, is that... that, that they're talking about different things. Um, Sonia's talking about how we raise the money, whereas Sean's talking about how we spend it more efficiently. So, you think so I don't think they're mutually exclusive. More them, so yes. I think if we, what we really need is, a, is a, a, a more nuanced question about the different ways that you can lever it in, because it's not all going to come through um, taxation as in, you know... The, the, there are very many ways that we can spread that. So I think that the question, if you, if you don't mind me saying so, is a little bit too simplistic. <laughs> <laughs> That's television for you. <laughs> 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 Uh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, feel free. Yeah. It's, a, it's a free and fair debate. Um, uh, Helen, uh, yeah. well, on the numbers, simplistic mm. or, or not, it does show, you know, quite, quite a split within, within views. You know, there is a debate available here, which is what we're having, of course. There is a debate, but, I mean, I have to say, having lived through some of the privatised bits of the NHS and see how things have been tried where private companies have come in and failed and it's gone wrong, and Sonia did re uh, refer to some of the rather embarrassing failures where things just haven't worked. Well, we worked. touched on it with the IT project as we well. We did, yeah, absolutely, and I think you know, so we need to absolutely be aware. And if we're going to go this route, then we absolutely have to learn from the past. Now, I'm very, very cautious. In general practice, it really hasn't worked terribly well. So I I'm, I'm have to say I'm on your side, Sonia. I really feel that it's, it's from the public person, so bring well, it on. I wasn't on. asking you to take sides, but you, you <laughs> have. Uh, enjoyed it. Uh, David, are you going to take sides? Um, well, I'm on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> sitter extraordinary. No, 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 no. no. Is it, was it 52, 48? It's, uh, it was 46, 54. <laughs> all right, so I won't mention Brexit. But, uh, <laughs> the consequence of that... For all really? That's a um, whole other debate. Uh, but, running out of but, time. But, but, I, but, you know, it's, um, it is the most efficient, the most effective way of raising money, general taxation, you know, throughout the, the world. If you just think, in the United States, it, they spend $500 billion collecting the money before they can give it out to healthcare. $500 billion. What a waste. Um, and not a penny of that is spent on direct patient care at all. And it's, it costs us almost nothing. David, thank you very much indeed. And that's it for this special debate about an institution with a, a special place in British society. Our thanks, of course, to Guy's Hospital for putting up with us. Uh, thanks, too, to our contributors. They are Sonia Soda, Sean Worth, Sir David Nicholson, Professor Helen Stokes-Lampard, Lord Darcy and Dr Sarah Wollaston, MP. And thank you to our voting audience here and to you at home for watching. From all of us here at Guy's Hospital, a very good night. <laughs>